Return of Rene Gonzalez and Fernando Gonzalez, Gonzalez to Cuba, uh, which we celebrate, and again, we're going to be going into that in more depth uh, this afternoon. And um, in our plan, we have, we've, we've got a whole range of um, exciting developments that uh, we very much want to share with you and get your views and contributions um, as we go through um, the different items today. Um, you've got the timetable, hopefully voting cards. Um, we have two speakers uh, later today. Uh, we've got um, Kevin Courtney, who's uh, Deputy General Secretary of the FET, will be joining us about 11 o'clock uh, to speak. And then straight after lunch, we've got um, Esther Armenteros, the Ambassador. Uh, it's her last year being Ambassador here, so we will um, um, formally thank her and she'll um, uh, talk to us. Um, during the day, what would be very helpful, some of you know each other, but not everybody knows everybody, um, so it would be very good if you introduce yourselves um, as to uh, what's your name and um, where you come from. Um, welcome individual members, and especially those representing our regional <coughs> affiliated organisations, which are a very important part of um, the support and our work. Um, the speaking times, just so everybody knows, is uh, six minutes to introduce a motion and three minutes for everyone else. And I think there's nothing else formally um, at this stage. Um, we want to uh, elect tellers, which are a couple of volunteers in terms of people who offer to vote, to kind of vote. So you to, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Michael McNeil and and green mantle. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the standing orders are the same, unchanged since last year, fairly straightforward, so I hope everybody's happy to go with those. Um, we also need to elect auditors. Um, to get that later. Okay, fine. We've got a number of um, apologies. We won't read them out. Uh, any other apologies on the floor for anyone you wanted to raise? No, no, no. Okay, thank you very much. Good. Okay, next item are the minutes from last year. So, uh, first of all, is there any issues that people want to raise from the minutes? Um, there's two pages of minutes. So, is there anything on the first page that anybody wishes to? Or the second page? If not, does everybody who is here be their correct record for what happened? Good. Thank you very much. Good. Um, so we now can go on to uh, the annual report of work, uh, which Rob Miller, um, as everybody knows, director of the Peace on the Bounty will present to us. Thank you for uh, coming on such a hot day. I hope it's not too hot in here. Um, put the aircon on later on a bit more if it is, but um, it's been a very busy year um, and anyone who was in London for the International Commission of Inquiry in March will know just how uh, busy it has been. Um, later on we've got a motion on the International Commission uh, of Inquiry into the case of Miami 5 and we're going to hopefully show a film. So I'm not going to dwell at length on the Commission in this annual report because a lot of the issues will come up again um, later on, but uh, I'm try and work this as well. All right, yeah, it's working. Um, the commission was a massive task for us, and as far as the annual report goes, just to say that it involved everybody at every level, from the executive, the officers, to all the staff, to a, a very a large team of volunteers who worked tirelessly over a very long period. In fact, we were working on the commission for about 18 months, and it really dominated. Uh, all of our efforts throughout the year. Uh, it also involved all our affiliates, or most of our affiliates becoming involved in one way or another, and of course our members around the country, and particularly our local groups, many of whom organised events in the build-up to the Commission um, to support the work of the Commission and also to raise 
funds to help uh, develop the commission. It also involved a lot of international organisations, so we had to attend meetings in Cuba, in Washington, in Germany and in Belgium. It was a European conference, so there was an awful lot of liaison, particularly between ourselves and colleagues uh, in, in a sister organisation in Belgium, and we're very grateful for all the work uh, from all of those participants who helped us to make sure that the Commission was so successful. Anyone who was there, and you'll see later in the film, will know the calibre of the commissioners, the three legal experts who came from South Africa, uh, France and India, and two of them were former uh, chief uh, attorney, chief judges, if you like, uh, from India and South Africa. The calibre of those judges meant that the outcomes of that commission are of a very high level and have uh, uh, give it a uh, level of um, credence or prudence, if you like, uh, that means that the, at the final report when it comes out, we're only at the preliminary report stage, but the final report of that commission will hold weight internationally as a legal document, which we hope will a enable us to take the uh, campaign for the five even further forward. You'll see from the events at the Law Society, where it was held at a very prestigious venue, it was a packed uh, conference room. Over 300 delegates attended from over 27 countries. Uh, around half were from the UK and the rest were mainly from Europe, but also from the United States and Cuba. And it is one of the most uh, important, I think, but also moving uh, events that we've ever staged. And everyone who attended was pretty much gripped by two days of compelling evidence from over 20 witnesses, including family members, uh, lawyers, Amnesty International, parliamentarians. Um, and it really went through every aspect of the case of the five to give an unequivocal, unequivocal um, outcome to the, the campaign for justice for these five and their families. At the same time, over 200 international um, celebrities endorsed the commission, broadened out the, the campaigning work of the event. We really didn't want, I remember standing here last year, saying that we didn't just want a legal event stuck in a smoky room. And we did everything we, we could to make sure that while we had the, the central um, core event uh, as a very legalistic event, a very professional event held at the Law Society with its excellent calibre of uh, witnesses and jurors, we wanted it to broaden out and to be a campaigning tool. So we made a big effort to bring on new forces. So it was sponsored or endorsed by such luminaries as Emma Thompson, the actress, uh, Peter Capaldi, the new Doctor Who actor, John le Carre, the, the writer, uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and so on and so forth. And 200 international figures endorsed the commission and the work. And we were honoured with the presence of Alice Walker, the uh, US writer, who came to London and spoke at the commission, but also spoke at the concert accompanying it. Um, so people like that, the former attorney from, uh, chief attorney from the US, Ramsey Clark was there, uh, Miguel Angel Martinez, who is one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament, was there. Ricardo Alacon, uh, former head of the Cuban Parliament, and so on and so forth. So the level of participation internationally gave the whole commission a real um, kudos, which I think everybody appreciated. It gave weight to the discussions and the findings. Uh, obviously, there was the issue of René Gonzalez. And René, the first of the five to have been released, was due to be the principal witness of the commission. And obviously for us, it would have been an incredible honour. It was the first country he was going to travel to outside of Cuba since his release. And that shows the level of uh, importance that the Cubans put on our work in this country and on the International Commission. And I'll go into it a bit more later on, because it's time now, but he was obviously banned from coming to London, which was an incredible uh, travesty, if you like, and a scandal, really, that our government should be implicated in that uh, anti-Cuban action. Uh, but I will speak about that a bit more later on. But we as a campaign, as far as our work goes, will need to reflect, obviously, on how we respond. We have to respond. We can't allow our government to be complicit in the campaign against the five without challenging it. And we are working on that now, and I'll speak a bit more about that uh, later.
later on. As well as the um, families, Renee, these are the, the mother and uh, wives of uh, Ramon and uh, Gerardo there, Adriana and Elizabeth, and also the daughter of René Gonzalez. Uh, there were uh, people from across uh, the globe, really, who have been involved in the campaign. And it, it really is, or was, the biggest campaign for the five outside of Cuba. Um, and we, we hosted it, so we're very pleased that we did. As well as the Law Society, we held a major concert um, at the Barbican, and I know some of you here were there, and around 2,000 people came to that concert. And the main acts were Amada Portuando and uh, Elia Sachoa, who are stars of the Buena Vista Social Club. And we also had uh, music from Omar Puentes, who many of you know. Uh, and we also had a whole host of uh, actors, mainly UK actors, including people such as Jonathan Price, um, and Francis de la Tour, and Alice Walker, and so forth, um, speaking on the platform, giving readings from the families between, between the family members. The key point about concert was that probably 70, 75 percent of the audience were new to that campaign. So A, we were able to broaden out and reach new people, but the response of those people to the words um, of the actors and to the whole story of the five was incredible. So we're hoping that will take things forward and broaden the campaign out to find new people. And that was very much the idea behind much of the uh, events surrounding the commission, uh, including the Barbican concert. Uh, this is Irma, the daughter of René, who gave uh, that very poignant speech, um, which started with the word, today I was not meant to cry. And uh, it was in reference to the fact that she was due to be there with her father. But once again, that had been cruelly denied to them. Uh, we also held a very major dinner as part of the commission events with uh, around 200 special guests, including many of the trade unions affiliated to Cuba Solidarity, hosted by Francis uh, O'Grady, who's the General Secretary of the TUC, and also by uh, Len McCluskey, General Secretary of Unite. And all of the trade unions were there, and it really showed the breadth and the depth of the support for our work and the campaign for the five amongst the British trade union movement. And again, we are incredibly grateful uh, for their support. Um, as part of the commission, we launched a new campaign called Voices for the Five. And this is part of the idea of taking what is essentially a legal commission and using it as a catalyst for a campaign. It doesn't stop with the two or three days in March. That's not the end of the campaign. That needs to be the beginning of a new phase in the campaign. And when we launched Voices for the Five, we thought we may get 500,000 people signing up. In fact, we're nearly at 7,000. And it's 7,000 people internationally. Only around 1,500 of those are from the UK. So we're now at the hub, if you like, and the Voices for the Five is at the hub of the biggest international campaign for the Five. So we have a responsibility now to take that campaign forward using those 7,000 people who we, will, we have contact with all of them to try and develop that campaign further. And we're exploring the options to try and take the campaign Voices for the Five further. And again, that will be very much the focus of the motion this afternoon. In terms of the Five, generally last year we held the very successful vigil again. We had the uh, young trade unionists over from Cuba speaking at the vigil. And there were two or three hundred people outside the US Embassy again with the candle at the vigil. And we will be organising a similar event uh, this year. Uh, one of the speakers, Tony Woodley, at the vigil um, from Unite. Um, this year um, has been a very difficult year. We lost two very important comrades. Um, Tony Benn, who was a recipient of the International Medal of Friendship. Um, there he is with Natasha Hickman, our communications manager at the event. And Tony spoke at events for us across the country at union conferences and so forth. And he obviously, um, it's a terrible him, but also to our work, to Philly family, but also to our, our work. And the second person, of course, was Bob Crow. And uh, the two comrades uh, lost Bob and Tony. It's a, it's a, a real tragedy uh, for all of us here in the UK, as far as we're concerned, and particularly for Cuban Solidarity Campaign. Um, Tony Ben was a patron, and uh, Bob was a friend of Cuba, and both helped us in many, many ways over the years, and were tireless in their support for Cuba. And uh, it's 
development of, a, of an independent and sovereign uh, Cuba and the campaign for the buy. And uh, anyone who's around next week, uh, if they can get to the RMT uh, party for the Garden Party for Cuba uh, on Wednesday, it'd be great to be there. There'll be many tributes there again um, to Bob and I'm sure Tony as well. And we as a campaign, I think we all agree, we would call that thanks yet again, although we did formally do that before, to those two comrades. The most important element out of our work of the year is our work around the trade unions. And we have 24 national trade unions affiliated and nearly 500 affiliated trade union organisations. So attending trade union conferences is a huge element of our work. And we attended last year over 30 trade union conferences and events with stalls, with information tables, running fringe meetings, bringing over speakers, organising social events and so on. And these are just some of the examples of the sorts of meetings uh, that we organised at trade union conferences um, over the previous year. This was at the TUC uh, in 2013 last year, uh, with Christine Blower from, from the UC, uh, Rodney Bickerstaff, Len McCluskey and so on, and two young trade unions over from, from Cuba. These are the types of stalls that we put on at the conferences. For those of you who haven't been to trade union conferences, you have these display stands, and we have, normally have a stand if we can to try and give out information. Events. This was at the Labour Party conference with Andrew Smith and the Ambassador and, and Adrian, where we often have many of those fringe meetings in conjunction with other organisations such as Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, because the two work very well together. Um, and you can see their Labour Party conference packed fringe meetings um, at TUC. We have generally what is regarded as the biggest fringe meeting at the TUC each year. Um, and that one at the Labour Party conference last year was completely packed um, also. Uh, we had Irma, the daughter of uh, Reddy Gonzalez, speaking at the Women's TUC to 200 uh, delegates at the Women's TUC. Uh, we also spend a lot of energy bringing people over from Cuba and also people to, to tour the country, rights and so forth. These are the two young Cuban trade unions who toured um, the UK in 2013 and spoke to many of our local groups and also spoke at the annual vigil. Um, we brought over a number of authors, a Canadian author, Keith Bollinger, who wrote a very important book on uh, uh, the blockade and the effects, and also other people such as Arnold August, and other author and so forth. So that programme of speaking to us is also a very important aspect of our work. We also spend a lot of time working on sending people to Cuba to find out the reality for themselves, and we run uh, two solidarity brigades each year. Um, and if anyone hasn't been on a brigade, Please sign up, they're brilliant. That's how I got involved in the first place with Sue, and I'm sure lots of people here got involved through the brigades. Um, the cycle tours continue, we're uh, mainly made up of trade unionists, but uh, they're very important for us, not least because they're a sponsored event, and that helps enormously. Um, and many of the tours visit the Abel Santa Maria School for the visually impaired, which is in Havana, and it, well, it says what it is. But it's a, 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 a wonderful place, and it's a school where we have a special relationship. It began with the relationship between the Music Fund for Cuba, which is our charity, uh, but also all the tour groups, if we can, visit the Amos Santa Maria School. And that's a lovely uh, part of our tour programmes uh, to Cuba. But obviously, if, you, if you're thinking of going to Cuba, they are fabulous. And the Revolution Route Tour and so forth uh, sell out each year. So do sign up for the tours if you can. This year also, we did a special uh, programme for the Idaho celebrations, which is the LGBT programme. Uh, in Cuba, um, and we took trade unionists over there to really use it as an opportunity to counter the myths about Cuba and LGBT rights, because there's this lingering attack on Cuba over LGBT rights, completely unfounded uh, in today's Cuba. Our local groups, many of whom are represented here today, are very much uh, the lifeblood of this campaign, and these are some examples of the sorts of meetings and events that our groups uh, take on. Uh, this is South London. Um, this is a civic reception in Oxford with the ambassador. Um, so groups do all sorts of varied activities. Um, this is some press coverage. It's very important if you do activities locally to get local press coverage. It's not that difficult. Local media uh, are always looking for local stories, and it can be done on any level. So any activity locally, we would encourage people to get in touch with the local press, and we can help with small releases and so forth for that. Uh, Manchester, they held a meeting of uh, the images of um, Antonio Guerrero, the artwork of one of the Miami Five. Um, and again, that's a protest um, on the Five, obviously. 
given the outside of the town hall or something like that in the middle of Leicester. Uh, Cambridge are still functioning. I think they have a regular monthly stall in Cambridge. And every time in QVC, there's a couple of pages about all the activities that pop out local groups. Uh, Leeds and the community festival. Um, and South London again. Oh, we've ever told who was a, a participate in the literacy campaign of uh, 1961, speaking. Derby, organising a sponsored walk uh, to raise funds. So the local groups, incredibly important. Again, we want to thank everybody active in groups around the country. Mm -hmm. A massive part of our work annually is the Latin American Conference, um, and in 2013 it was at the Congress House, and it was the biggest yet, with almost 600 attenders, uh, over 50 speakers from virtually every country of the region and a fascinating insight to the region, putting Cuba centrally into the progressive uh, wave that has been sweeping uh, the continent. And we, as Cuba Solidarity, play the leading role in organising the Latin American Conference. So it's a major part of our work in the year. Uh, one of the speakers, James Mill, speaking at the conference. And again, the ambassador speaking at the conference. And then he we speaking at a conference, just to show you the range of it. Last year, for the first year, we organised a, a sponsored event. It was very much in response to the financial situation we faced last year, which we reported on, and I'm sure James will mention. And we organised a sponsored event for the first time, the Walk to Cuba, which was a fabulous event, and over 80 people joined that walk. There are leaflets on your table, on your chairs, and I would really, really urge you to come along. It's not an arduous walk, it's not going to... You know, it's a lovely day out, it's a beautiful sunny day. We had a fabulous time. We stopped off at a few pubs on the way, tea and cakes on the way home, and we had a fabulous time and raised almost £5,000 in sponsorship. So if anybody has uh, or would like to join the Walk of Cuba, the date which is on... Sunday 13th of July. There you are, the Sunday the 13th of July. It really, and it's World Cup final day, but... That doesn't match. The cup final will be on if you're worried. So uh, <laughs> we can all go watch it together. But please do come along. All of our executives have promised to come as their one major contribution. <laughs> it's a fabulous event, and I do hope you'll join us um, this year. And there we are. Be really beautiful walk uh, through the countryside just outside of London uh, on the edge of London. And a good opportunity to meet lots of people. We also launched the Friends of Cuba, or developed the Friends of Cuba initiative, and again, there are leaflets on your chairs. And this is the Garden Party, which is now an annual event for everyone who has become a friend of Cuba. And really, the Friends of Cuba scheme is really to help us to find long-term funding, uh, and stable funding for our work through the year. So there's a couple of ideas there for helping the campaign directly. And it's actually Ambassador's Residence, and it's a lovely event, and it's open to all everyone who is friends or has joined the Friend of Cuba initiative. Uh, star study, look, Rodney Bickstaff and uh, Bill Manzanera. And if you're not sure who he is, he was a guitar player in Roxy Music. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a lovely event, and we try and bring uh, those kind of people along. Uh, finally, just on our report, we've had a, a good year as far as membership goes. Um, you can see the membership figures there um, on the end of the the report in uh, the individual membership um, has gone has, has uh, climbed slightly to 3,298. We had a big drop last year, but that was primarily, as we reported last year, due to the fact that we'd uh, gone through our entire records and found a whole host of standing order payers who had actually, in fact stopped paying by standing orders and we hadn't uh, got rid of off of our list. So we had a big clean up of our list. So this is a much more accurate reflection of our membership. And in writing to all those people, we've re-recruited a number of those back and worked hard to stabilise the membership. So we've increased membership uh, by around about 100 in the year. And importantly, I think, affiliations. We've managed to keep the trend of increasing affiliations. And the affiliations, while it's not such a big leap this year, it's still a, a growth. And it's incredibly important for those trade union branches. And there are over, over uh, 500, uh, nearly 550 branches now and local Labour Party groups and so forth that were affiliated to the campaign. And if you think about all their memberships and all the people we're reaching, you can see how Cuba Solidarity is able to organise uh, events across the country of a large term standing, such as the International Commission of Inquiry. Finally, and I know I'm out of time, 
I'd like to thank, uh, personally thank all the staff at Cuba Solidarity Campaign, uh, Trish, me in here, who does an amazing job uh, looking after the office and all of us, um, and overseeing the finance and, and started there for many years and does a brilliant job. Um, Tim Turner, who's around, uh, who's been with for about a year, who's, who's working on admin and finance also. Natasha Hickman, who's our communications manager and edits, uh, brings together QC magazine each time, who's down at Unison Conference setting up uh, for the conference next week. And also all the others uh, who help in the office, particularly people such as Jan and Lorraine and Jenny, who come in regularly. Uh, but there are a whole host of people who uh, come into the office either on a weekly basis or pop in and out, come in for national mailings and so forth, without whom we couldn't function as an organisation. So a very big thanks to absolutely everybody, and particularly a big thanks to all our members and local groups and affiliates, because without all of your help and your dedication through the year, we really wouldn't be able to function to the level we do function as an organisation. But thank you very much. Thank you. The point is we had a, a good year financially um, in the, the sense that we made a, a surplus, which is the first surplus I think for around for five years. Um, obviously we've, we've struggled to, uh, to make ends meet uh, recently um, and we did pass a, a resolution um, last year's AGM to uh, focus on, on fundraising activities and to, uh, to that extent we've been been very successful. Um, I mean, a couple of, well, a few, a few of the key activities. I've also uh, mentioned a little bit already, but we we had the raffle, which was uh, extremely successful. That was eleven thousand pounds raised uh, to help the campaign from that. The walk for Cuba, I've said, raised almost uh, five thousand pounds. We um, we've, we've got the ongoing uh, Friends of CFC. Campaign which raised uh, around thirteen thousand uh, pounds, up from, from nine thousand in two thousand and two, uh, two thousand and twelve, um, and QVC sponsorship. We've worked hard on uh, from the office that raised seventeen thousand pounds, which was up from, from about eight k in the in the prior year. So taking all those um, additional income sources into account, combined with uh, good cost control and attempts to save money where we can. Um, basically drove the, uh, the 25k surplus that we uh, were able to achieve for the 2013 calendar year, um, which was, was good. Uh, for 2014, I think the key message is that we just carry on, as we have done, focusing on some key fundraising areas, the two main ones for this summer being the, uh, the walk that Rob's talked about and the Friends of, of CSC. And if we can push those again, if we can keep the costs down to a, to a minimum, and if we can uh, focus on you know, make, making money or making break even on, on our sort of key activities, then hopefully we'll be able to get to a year end position where we make another small surplus and uh, a, a small resultant increase in the overall bank balance of the organisation, which is at 90, well, it was at 97k at the beginning of this year. If we get that up a little bit, that would be good because it's still perhaps a little bit low for an organisation around of our size and, and turnover. But um, as I say, overall, an excellent year and uh, we just need to carry on doing as we've done uh, in 2013. So if there's any questions, we have the time. Yeah, so, no, well, I mean, because obviously this essentially the income and expenditure account for the, the relevant calendar year. So up to the end of 2013, we've received into, into the bank monies relating to that commission, which sums to, uh, to £18,000. But at that point in time, we'd only spent around uh, 500 of it. On, on direct um, costs, so you will see the uh, the additional spend um, related yeah. to that coming through in the, in the 2014 yeah. account. So essentially, a timing difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's one of the problems of just having a cut off. Yeah. It's not 
Yeah, yeah. So, so next, next year, back, you'll see the expenditure. Sorry, do some love, just so the people at the back can hear. Yeah, I'm um, Sarah. Um, the 24,000. Before we go on to our special guest speaker, uh, we need to elect auditors. And um, last year, our auditor was Monty Goldman, who did uh, his usual wonderful job. Um, are there any nominations? Uh, welcome to the NUT's headquarters. We're very pleased once again to have the Keep the Solidarity campaign here for this important meeting in, in your annual schedule. Now, the NUT is striving to be an internationalist union. We see international work as absolutely core to our work of defending teachers and education in this country. So we, uh, we have links with the General Union of Palestinian Teachers. We recently had a delegation to Palestine. We are doing some work around the fact that Palestinian children are discriminated against and arrested by the Israeli state. In this hall, only a few weekends ago, we had uh, teachers from trades unions in Ecuador, in India, from Chicago, from around the world, teachers who are facing the same sort of battles that we're facing here against the privatization of their education service, against what we call the global education reform movement. So we're striving to be an internationalist union, and we see Cuba as an important part of that. But there's a strange difference, because the teachers we talk with in Cuba are not fighting privatization. They're not fighting the global education reform movement. There are certainly challenges, and there's an enormous need for solidarity, but there's a, there's a difference that's worth reflecting on for us in terms of our international work. In terms of what we do with Cuba, we usually have people at the Pedagogica Conference which is the biggest conference of educators in Latin America and happens in Cuba every couple of years, which is a fantastic event and we usually have people there. We send people on tours to Cuba periodically. We are currently supporting uh, on an annual basis two, uh, two, two teachers to come here from Cuba for English language training. These are teachers working on the, the medical internationalist program, training doctors to be better at speaking English for when they're doing international projects in English-speaking countries. So we're doing those sorts of bits of work with, in solidarity with the, with the Cuban revolution. We see what happens in Cuban schools and we reflect on it. The fact that class sizes are 20 in Cuba is interesting to us when teachers are struggling with classes of 30, 32, 33, 34 in this one of the richest countries in the world. We see that Cuban teachers their trade unions, tell us that they feel involved by the government in what's going on in schools. And there's a, there are processes of change, reform that happen, but they feel centrally involved in them. And they tell us that their schools feel very much at the heart of their communities. So there are things that we want to learn from Cuba. But all of those things conditioned always by the struggles. And so that's what I wanted to to say something about, I know that you come to these meetings and in these meetings you not only talk about the solidarity work you're doing, but you talk about the achievements of the Cuban government. And yet I think it's easy for us to take those achievements for granted. We hear about Cuba and what we need to say, what we need to hear about is the lowest infant mortality rates in the Americas, the highest literacy rates, the massive strides in equality which means that women now make up 48% of MPs in Cuba. Five decades of achievement in health, education, and internationalism. 
But we need to stop and think about that. A small island with practically no oil, mineral resources. For these achievements to come from that small island, just 90 miles off the coast of the world's most aggressive superpower, aggressive towards Cuba. An island suffering the crippling effects of 52 years of economic warfare, terror attacks, and covert subversion. This small island and these people, according to the 2010 report, are responsible for saving more than 1.6 million lives and treating over 85 million patients around the world through their internationalist medical missions. This is an astonishing achievement for a country suffering those sorts of attacks. Responsible for developing a system of literacy and teaching that's taught more than 7, 7 million people in 28 countries to read and write. Along with Venezuela, Cuba is responsible for, a, for performing more than 3 million site-saving operations as part of Operation Miracle. But outside of these meetings, how often do you hear about those achievements? We need to think about the critical differences between Cuba and many other countries when we talk about human rights. We need to think about what the common perceptions are of Cuba in the, media, in the mainstream media and how we're going to challenge them. And we have to think about the Western government's attitudes towards Cuba. The US government and the wealthy, the landed elites across Latin America, are continuing their 50-year campaign to overthrow the Cuban government and the achievements of the Cuban people. All of which, all those achievements gained whilst enduring an inhuman blockade aimed at destroying the economy and making it more difficult for Cuba to develop. But it's important to note, isn't it, the US has failed in its aim, and Cuba still stands as an example to the mass of the peoples of Latin America and the whole of the world. Yet Cuba is accused of human rights abuses by the US. But how many Cubans have forcibly disappeared in the last 50 years? How many Cubans have been forcibly displaced inside their own country? How many Cuban trades unionists have been murdered in the last 50 years? And the answer is none. So the, the US really needs to take the, the beam out of its own eye before looking at the speck in Cuba's. Why is it a country where people live in peace, where they're free of hunger and illiteracy? Why is that country punished and ostracized? And you have to know, because we do know, it's purely because Cuba provides the threat of a good example, a vision of society that the US government does not want other countries in the region and the world to follow. Cuba shows the example to us that even in the face of 50 years of fierce aggression from the most powerful nation on earth, that a people can stand tall with dignity and build a society that despite not being by any means perfect, fundamentally functions for the benefit of all. But this stance has been of a great cost to Cuba and its people. We owe them a debt for withstanding what's been described the greatest violation of the human rights of an entire people, the US blockade. In 1961, the US had a stated aim for the blockade, to grind the Cuban people down with hunger, shortages and despair so that they would be forced to rise up against their government. And 52 years later, 52 years of sustained economic warfare, the aim of the American blockade is still the same and the Cuban people still resisting. The blockade has cost, on many estimates, more than one trillion dollars to the Cuban economy since its introduction. And nowhere, perhaps, is this more ethically and morally reprehensible than in the denial of access to medical equipment and supplies. Cuba is prevented from buying more than 40% of the medicines that are available on the world market. These restrictions cost its health service more than 39 million US dollars in the last year. This undeniable harm to Cuba and its people should be classed and could be classed by the UN as an act of genocide against an entire people. Surgeons in Cuba sometimes have to make a terrible choice. Two children with heart to heart problems, and because of the blockade, they can only get one of the, uh, of the bits of equipment from the states and heart valves. And they have to make a 
choice between which child lives and dies simply because of a medical blockade. Cuba could buy these things if they were, if they were allowed to on the international market. It is truly disgraceful to be using this blockade in this way, in a way that damages children's lives, takes away their lives. It's disgraceful. Examples of the blockade range from those matters of life and death to ridiculous and petty. We need to tell people that a US citizen who comes here, goes to a UK pub and orders a Havana club uh, rum, is trading with the enemy, could be fined under the US legislation if they were known to the US government. Isn't that astonishing? The fact that companies in the UK, such as the Royal Bank of Scotland and Barclays, are paying huge fines to the US Treasury for minor trading with Cuba. These are US sanctions that they are applying in this country. It's a disgrace, and we should be challenging it loudly. The parties in this country should be refusing to kowtow to it. We had hoped that President Obama would herald changes in this relationship. But in fact, the US continues spending millions of dollars on anti-Cuban destabilization, destabilization campaigns and propaganda. The language in some respects has got lighter, but the aim is still the same. They still want to destroy the gains of the revolution and introduce US neoliberal policies and control over the whole of Cuba. We know in the NUT it's not just Cuba that they're ahead. They want to extend their control over the global education reform movement. They want neoliberal education spread across the world. The transatlantic trade arrangements that they're currently looking for. They want companies, US companies, to be able to sue sovereign states in tri hidden tribunals in order to force privatization through. But at the heart of it, attacking Cuba as the example, their attack to spread their neoliberal agenda across the whole of the world. And they're doing it not, as I said, not just by direct sanctions against Cuba, but sanctions which apply in, th in other countries. Since Obama took office, fines on international companies have dramatically increased. $2.5 billion have been levied in fines in other countries on other companies, more than in, under the entire time of George Bush. Foreign banks in this situation increasingly cautious about any transactions involving Cuba something confirmed by numerous foreign businessmen in Havana. A foreign banker in a recent interview with Reuters said, banks calculate the risk versus the gain in doing business with Cuba, even when the transactions are legal. Many times banks decide it's not worth the risk. So the embargo is getting worse. It's not easing under President Obama. The threats to the Cuban people get greater. But for the rest of the world, and especially in Latin America, Cuba is the beacon of hope, and it's inspired many of the progressive movements across the world. The Lendes Chile, the, the, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and now the governments in Bolivia, Venezuela, and Ecuador. Cuba's leading the way in showing that another world is possible. And the people of Cuba have created a society that truly is worth defending. But collectively, the price has been high. 70% of the Cubans have been born since the blockade, with that $1 trillion stolen from their country by the efforts of the Americans. They are the victims of a US imperialism against Cuba, and the campaign for their freedom is not just a humanitarian fight for the Cuban people, it's a humanitarian fight for the whole of the world. And maybe the people, the five people in Cuba who have suffered most, the Miami Five, we need to think and reflect on the attitude our government has to their fight. Because when we see that René Gonzalez says it goes beyond a trial, the cruelty against Cuba, it's revenge for all the resistance of the Cuban people, we recognize that as true. When René Gonzalez and Fernando Gonzalez are home in Cuba, we celebrate that. We can't rest until the others are home. But when we see that our government, the government in this country, has banned René Gonzalez from coming to London to attend an international commission of inquiry, that is an absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace that deserves the loudest possible condemnation, not just from the people in this room, but from the NUT, from the rest of the trade union movement in the United Kingdom, from the Labour Party, from, I think, as Jonathan said, from people beyond the left, the idea that we are banning René Gonzalez from coming here is an absolute disgrace.
that's something that we have to speak out about in the loudest possible manner. Gerardo Hernandez, who will not leave prison alive unless we succeed in our campaign, says, and I think this has been referred to already, this is a political case, it needs a political solution, and the only jury that is going to free the Miami Five is a jury of millions. And that's our task, and that's why the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, the Voices for the Five campaign, that's why they're so essential, and it's why I'm proud, on behalf of the NUT, to be standing here in solidarity with you today, in solidarity with the CSC, with the people of Cuba, with the Miami Five. Thanks, Amber Ross. shining example of Cuba and the responsibility that our organisation, all of us here today have uh, to try and put many of these rights, when many of these wrongs right. Well, I think that's a very um, good backdrop for moving on to our next item, which is our annual plan, our plan for the work of the next year in trying to make progress in the um, situation we just heard about. Um, um, Secretary Bernard Reason will um, present the plan. We'll then um, debate the motions um, before us and then we'll vote on those and then come back to vote on the plan as a whole with whatever motions we've passed um, in the meantime. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Stu. Um, just to say I'm delighted to have heard Kevin's comments as a member of the National Union of Teachers. I'm very proud of the kind of comments that he made and the stance that the union is taking it wasn't always the case with my union, but I'm very pleased that it is, uh, has moved in the direction that Kevin expressed. I just want to talk about uh, some events that have occurred over the last six months, because as we have discussed before, I think there were people who, seeing the election of President Obama, thought perhaps this signaled some kind of change and that it might augur a better relationship between the United States of America and Cuba. But I think we in the campaign have always tried to disavow people who have been over-optimistic about uh, superficial aspects of changes that may have taken with the election of President Obama. And I think we have to enter a similar note of caution in respect of some of the reports that have come out over the last six months. For example, in February of this year, a poll was taken which clearly identified that the opinion of the majority of Americans was now for a normalization of relationships between the USA and Cuba. 56% of the population indicated they wanted to see a change. A similar number also said they thought that the embargo, the blockade, should be ended. In May of this year, there was an open letter from someone whose name will be familiar to you, uh, John Negroponte, former international director of intelligence under George Bush, which also was calling on Obama to change U.S. policy in relation to Cuba. In June of this year, the Miami Herald conducted a survey which showed that in Florida itself and in Miami-Dade County, which is one of the areas of Florida which has the largest number of uh, Cuban uh, exiles in it, actually there showed a high proportion in favor of ending the blockade and changing relationships between the USA and Cuba. And in fact showed that amongst Florida residents and amongst Latinos, the proportion of those wishing change actually was greater. Just two days ago, Hillary Rodden Clinton, who is quite probably going to be the Democratic Party's candidate in the 2016 election, said in an interview at the Council for Foreign Affairs <laughs> that she thought a change should take place in Cuba-American relations. Now, I think you might think, just hearing all of those things, that it indicated some kind of significant change. But I think it's very important to register what underpins those. And the comment from Hillary Clinton, I think, was extremely interesting in explaining why she's advocating that change. One was quite simply because she said that the policies enacted today had brought about no change. In other words, what is she saying? She's saying, let's, let's not change our strategy towards Cuba, let's change our tactics. The objective remains the same. The way of arriving at it, she's suggesting, needs to vary because what has been practiced so far has failed. 
And the second thing that she said, which was also very interesting, and I'll quote, she said that it would help our relationship throughout Latin America because it's also used as an excuse here. Every conversation at every summit of the Americas starts with a conversation about Cuba. I would like to see that excuse removed. So what she is saying is an entirely pragmatic position about shifting possibly the way in which the case against Cuba is prosecuted by the United States, but not changing the objective which they're seeking to achieve. The European Union also has begun to modify its change. And we've seen in the last few months, in April of this year, the Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius of France visiting and talking about relations. And again, what's behind that is not only them looking for opportunities as they perceive it, perhaps for investing in Cuba and profiting out of changes that may come there, but it's also about seeing Cuba as a critical gatekeeper in relation to the whole of Latin America. So these changes that they're putting forward are changes that are for pragmatic reasons. They're not changes of substance, I think. And we can say that is true because the evidence remains in case. We've talked about some of the things that Kevin mentioned about fines that have been imposed, and we've noted that over the years. But we've seen also in the last 12 months the record of what the United States has been undertaking. For instance, between 1996 and the year 2004, through USAID, the government of the United States of America assigned $34 million to 25 counter-revolutionary organizations in Cuba. And you can read the list of those. The New American Foundation, the Pan American Foundation for Development, International Relief and Development Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba, and so on and so forth. All of these funded from the United States of America with the specific objective of pursuing the aim of changing, uh, breaking changes in Cuba. And we've also seen, uh, exposed by uh, a, a release of information which wasn't planned, uh, for example, the way in which they do this, the various uh, strands that they take, not only the direct attacks like through the blockade, the fining and so on and so forth, but trying through social media, establishing a Twitter uh, account in, in Cuba, which got 40,000 subscribers, the idea of which was clearly to harvest people who they perceived as being potential allies in trying to subvert the revolution from inside of Cuba. So the attacks by the United States of America under President Obama have not changed one iota. And of course, as we said last year, and remains true, the litmus test of looking at the United States policies is, of course, their attitude on the case of the five. Of course, as we have said earlier in today's AGM, we welcome the fact that René Gonzalez and Fernando Gonzalez have now released an incident. I just heard on Twitter this morning, I don't know if others of you have seen it, that Fernando has been made Vice President of ECAP, uh, and uh, Kenya has sent a message out on that, and I think we should send a message of congratulations to Fernando from this AGM in recognition of that having taken place. <laughs> but whilst we celebrate Fernando and René's release, of course we have to remind ourselves they had served their term of office. They were not released under any kind of concession. And of course, as people have said earlier, Antonio, still has three years to serve and not due for release until 2017. Ramon Lavanino has still 10 more years to serve, not due for release until the 30th of October, 2024. And of course, Gerardo Hernandez, no prospect of release because of the double life sentence and 15 years. So the campaign around the five remains a central task and we'll be discussing in a resolution that's before the AGM in more detail ideas about how we can advance that campaign. It's extremely important and key. And to indicate why their work was important and that kind of work of actually subverting any attempts to terror bring a terrorist actions in Cuba, if any reminder needs to be made, just uh, a few uh, weeks ago, in, uh, on the 7th of May, four people were arrested in Havana for actually planning exactly the kind of attacks that were backed by Luis, Luis Posada Carillas, the explosions that took place in the hotels, and so on. So these threats to Cuba about terrorism, which were subverted by the five, remain active and live to this day. So their case remains an entirely just one, and one that we should absolutely make central to this campaign. And I won't discuss what, we, uh, what we're suggesting, because we have a resolution where we can look at that in greater detail. 
So we have, as many people have said, really serious tasks to undertake for the coming year. Not least of which, in my view, is addressing the attitude of our government in terms of its attitude towards Cuba generally on the blockade and on the right to Cubans to express their own independence and sovereignty, but also on the treatment of René González. And we're going to be pursuing the campaign for René and Fernando to come over here to address meetings so we can continue to build the campaign. Comrades, there are other things I would have wished to say, but just to say that I think it's extremely important, as people have said, that we build a campaign, we encourage people to join it, we look at the question of areas of constituencies where we can build it, and we need to expand, particularly, I think, in relation to young people and out into the student movement, as well as into the trade unions. Yes, our membership has increased over the last year, but I'm not being discourteous to you or to the local groups. In actual fact, 4,000 is not the size that this organisation should be. We should be many thousands more, in my view, and I think we should make one of our tasks in the coming year expanding and building the organisation, and I hope that we do that. Defending Cuba is critical to the people of Cuba, but as, as I've suggested, I think it's also critical for the future of the whole of Latin America. The tragedy that we're seeing unfolding now in the Middle East is a consequence of imperialist policies. I don't think that is on the agenda in any way, shape or form for Latin America, but that gives you an insight to the extent to which imperialism is uh, intent on oppressing people in order to gain its own, uh, make its own gains to its own advantage. Defending Cuba is critically important. It's key to defending Latin America as a whole. Thank you very much.
after all, it was an international commission of inquiry and we wanted a fair hearing from all aspects and all elements uh, and all parties. On the 27th of February, uh, a week before the commission was due to start, we received a lovely letter from Ambassador Barzoun, the ambassador in London here. And he thanked us very much for the kind invitation and he welcomed uh, the invitation and unfortunately said that on this occasion, due to his diary commitments, <laughs> he would be unable to attend. But however, he wished us all well and hoped the commission uh, was fruitful. And it was quite a sort of letter you sit back and ponder a bit and wonder why on earth you've received this charming letter from the US ambassador on this particular issue. We received that on the 27th of February. At the same time, we were awaiting the visa approval for René Gonzalez from the British Embassy in Havana, and it was clear that there were issues. He'd been called back in to answer some more questions, and they hadn't yet issued the visa to him, while they had issued the visa to every other Cuban participant. We started to contact the uh, office, the Home Office, uh, the UK Border Agency, the relevant members of Parliament, to try and urge uh, the visa to be uh, given and the trade unions, members of parliament here did sterling work uh, to contact the British government on the issue. On the 3rd of March, just four days before the commission was due to start, René was due to fly and on the 3rd of March he was told in the morning that his visa had been denied. So on the very last moment, the day he packed his bags ready to come to London, he was told he was unable to travel to the UK. We obviously protested, I think 30 odd MPs sent letters of protest, members of the House of Lords and so on, unions in this country mobilised everybody, a brilliant letter from the TUC, from Francis O'Grady to the Home Secretary Theresa May and so on. We did absolutely everything we could uh, to try and expedite a change and to <coughs> allow him to come to no avail. When we finally received the documents from the British government, the documents that said René was denied a visa, they were dated the 27th of February, the very same date that the US ambassador had sent us such a charming letter. Now I'm not a conspiracist in, in, in these things and perhaps this was just a coincidence, but as far as I'm concerned, I'll say it here now, they sent that letter of apology once they knew that the British government had done exactly what they were told and had banned René Gonzalez from the UK. Now, this is perhaps the other side of our special relationship with the United States. And it is an absolute scandal that our government, Theresa May, Cameron, Hay, feel that they should be party to this vindictive war of aggression against the Cuban people and against these families. And when we told families on the, the, the Thursday that the appeals had been unsuccessful, for us, it was a bit of a shock, maybe we were naive, but when we told them, they kind of shrugged their shoulders. And at that moment, I realised that the denial of the visa was just yet another element in a 50-year war of aggression against Cuba. And it was no surprise to the family that not just the United States, but also our government should participate in that 50-year-old war. And that shrug of the shoulders told me more about the fortitude of the families than I'd witnessed previously to that. We spent two days in appeals. I spent a whole day with Martin Garbus and barristers uh, from Michael Mansfield's chambers in the law courts in London. We took it all the way to judicial review, the highest body we could take it to. We're not going to allow it to stand. We're working with the barristers and the trade unions and the MPs right now to issue a new invitation and we will challenge any decision if it comes back to us. We're wording the, the invitation in such a way and making the invitation from the right people to make it very, very difficult for the British government to turn his visa down. Just out of interest, he was flying by Paris because that was the flight we had him on. The French gave him a visa, welcomed him into the French Embassy in Havana. He decided to carry on, go to Paris to meet Olga and uh, meet her and have a few days in Paris, which was always the plan. They came to London, then they joined him in Paris. He went to Paris, he was welcomed off the plane. He was looked after by the French people and the French government. He can now travel to every other country in Europe, except the UK. 
it's an absolute disgrace and we won't allow it to stand. And it will be one of our areas for campaigning over the next period. Just in general, and I know David's going to say a few more words, but the Commission was a launch pad, as I said earlier, for more campaigning. It doesn't finish with that Commission. The Commission report will come out, the final report will come out, hopefully in the next few weeks. We're still waiting for the, the judges to, to finalise that report, and we will present that report here, but also to uh, the US government um, in Washington. But one crucial element is the campaign uh, I mentioned before, the Voices for the Five, because I think, and we think as a campaign, that we can use that starting point of 7,000 people internationally to try and now look to 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, and more people who could sign up to uh, work on this campaign for justice with an end product of calling on Obama to give a humanitarian release. That's an important <coughs> point, because gone are the days when we should be chewing over the legals in ins and outs of this case. Gone are the days when really we should be going into the effects of, uh, or the, the impact of this particular case on the politics between the US and Cuba and the blockade. We, to broaden out this campaign now, we need to talk about it in terms of a humanitarian case. Whatever anyone's opinions, not just your opinions, but anybody's opinions in Britain of these five, whether even if they think they're the worst right-wing communist spies going, everybody can recognise that 15 years is too long. The only crime they committed was being an undeclared agent of a foreign country. They did no wrong and no harm. And under any other situation, they would have been sent home. If they were Irish or Russians, they would have been sent home. So we have to move it to a humanitarian situation, we have to focus on the families, we particularly need to focus on Gerardo Hernandez, a bit like we focused on Mandela during the Freedom of 70 campaigns and the campaign against apartheid. Because by focusing on Gerardo, who's got a double life sentence, we believe, and I believe, that we can broaden this campaign out much further. We have to, as speakers after speakers have already said. 7,000 people is not that many. We need to multiply that. We need personalities and celebrities. And we're determined to use the Voices for the Five uh, campaign as the basis for an international movement that will ultimately see justice and see freedom for the remaining prisoners. And that is essentially the motion, and I hope that you will support it. Here. Thank you. He's been involved internationally, building up the, uh, the um, commission and so on. And, um, going to Holbein and to uh, a special event in Havana uh, last September. But last week, a delegation from the UK went to the third annual Five Days for the Five. And while the other events um, helped to establish the Commission as a really clear focus for the international campaign, our role in Washington, D.C. was slightly different. I just want to say that the Five Days had a whole series of events. It had a, a press conference which got a significant article in the Washington Post which you can see on the um, uh, uh, website. It had a two-day conference uh, with up to 200 people at it from over 30 countries that um, was premised on the idea that um, there's a new era in relations between uh, Cuba and the U.S. for a variety of reasons, uh, not only the polls, there was a, a whole range of things. Bernard outlined um, some of those reasons, but you had a wide range of views, every imaginable view you can think of on the relations between the two, how to take the campaign forward, and so on. Um, there was also, I think it was our high point for us, was there was a very spirited uh, march of about 500 people from the White House to the Justice of, uh, Department of Justice, which began with about several hour cavalcade, a bicycle cavalcade uh, through Washington, very noisy event, and one of uh, the delegation, Mike Hedges from Unite, uh, participated in that. But there was also two days of uh, lobbying Senate and uh, Congress. And we were able to, through uh, the Commission, able to participate in all of those events. We prepared before we went with the um, Belgian coordinators of the Commission just a, a small pamphlet uh, which summarized the Commission and which just presented the preliminary report uh, of the uh, Commissioners. So we took that and also 39 parliamentarians uh, had presented an appeal uh, to their uh, counterparts in Congress and Senate asking them to uh, appeal to Obama to release the five. 
So the, when the final report comes out, and that's going to be any day, we hope, uh, it'll be put on the website, obviously, uh, Voices for the Five, and it'll be published, and we'll be able to use that for a campaigning tool as we look ahead. And uh, that is what this resolution addresses, the types of things that we want uh, to consider in how we can reach out, broaden the uh, base of support for the campaign, and how to use the gains that have been made in the last year, which have been considerable. Rob's mentioned that we've got 6,500 uh, a database now, people that have done something, have written in, have signed up, said they want to do something on an international level. We've got a new report by Amnesty, a new uh, submission by Amnesty International, which will also help us to uh, broaden out the campaign. And of course we have the outcome of the commission and we shouldn't underestimate this. Um, this, this commission involved very eminent judges. Um, they weren't sort of people that you would say, oh, well, they got them, but we know what the outcome's going to be. We don't even have to have the witnesses. They heard over two days a whole range of witnesses. And um, you've got someone like the, you know, Saberwal, who, Justice Saberwal, who's the former Chief Justice of the High Court of India. I mean, these are very mainstream people who have a great deal of authority. And what they said in their preliminary report was that on the basis of that, that there should be a pardon for all the five and that they should, the three remaining should be released immediately and unconditionally. So we, that's a big gain for the campaign uh, that, we, that we've made. There are big gains uh, last year that we've made. And these are very important as we take them into all the areas that are outlined in the resolution. Into the student unions, as Rob said, we're trying to think around how, uh, you know, we use Mandela as a, as a, a figure as we, in the anti-apartheid movement you know, uh, Gerardo Hernandez for Chancellor, or halls of, you know, different halls, university halls or whatever, named after the Cuban pie, that kind of thing, to reach out to involve uh, young people. Also, how we take it into trade unions and develop that at all levels. We have that and we have affiliations with different unions, but how to really develop the um, large number of, you know, rank and file trade unionists that um, uh, have been interested in the campaign, and have you know put in voices as well, put their voices on the website, and also the interfaith organisations and local communities. These are the areas that we want to get into to broaden the campaign and to say, as Rob says, we don't care what their views are on Cuba, what their views are on. It's just what we have to look at is that this is a campaign where justice has to be done, and uh, that's what we're demanding uh, in the campaign. I just want to say finally one noticeable thing about the. Um, Five days for the five. There was they had a, a cultural event in the evening. It was a hip hop event, and it attracted about 500 um, youth. Uh, oh, uh, lots of people, but noticeable was the youth and the um, African American youth that were involved. And these people, some of them came to the march the next day, and in fact, a few speakers came from there. It was sort of like a smaller Barbican, like our Barbican event. And I think that both of those confirmed what, we, what we've said right from the uh, Beyond the Frame uh, exhibition and with the Barbican, that cultural events can attract broader forces to the campaign that are not, you know, attracted to, like, say, a, a, you know, a meeting. You could call a meeting, but if you have an exhibition or if you have a music event or something, you can attract larger uh, or broader numbers of people to that. And these are the things that can be duplicated in the coming year by local groups to help us broaden the campaign. You know, either musical events or art exhibitions, because we, we know that Antonio uh, Guerrero has, has uh, done these works. And the good thing is that the campaign actually has the exhibition ready. Any groups that want to show the uh, Antonio uh, Guerrero exhibition just have to call the office, and the office will help with the preparation of the event with the publicity and with pointers in, with respect to how it can really, you know, you can move into the uh, community unions and so on to build it. And I think this is the way um, that we are going to broaden it and it is the way that we're going to, um, you know, reach the and build the jury of millions that we keep talking about. Uh, Manchester, I, I just want to describe, we had a, a public meeting and showing of the paintings by Antonio Guerrero in February. Uh, about 70 or more people came along to it, but it, it was interesting some of the people who came, five of them in particular, were um, 
drawn to the meeting because they were relatives of people who were in prison in this country through joint enterprise convictions. And they, as they learned about the five, the conspiracy charges, the frame up, they began to see, they saw a parallel between what their relatives were going through, that is that they were sent to jail for a crime that they hadn't been a part of. They were alleged to have connections with people who'd car carried out the crime. So that they saw they had a connection. You know, so there was a bit of them in what the five were, were, were going through, and uh, it was part of what drew them to, <coughs> to the event. And I, I think it's important to think about, because there's thousands of people who face the justice, so-called justice system in this country and around the world, who can see through, as they hear the story of the five, uh, that, that, that they have a common fight. But there was one other thing that they liked about the paintings, which is important, that they described how their own relatives, are, they're largely broken by their experiences in prison. That's what prisons do to you. But what you get through the paintings is the spirit of resistance, the solidarity, the fight in the five. And they liked that, that th these people, they're from a campaign called Joint Enterprise, they're gonna organize a fundraising event for their campaign in, in Liverpool. And they want to show the paintings at that fundraising event. So having done one thing, it, it leads to a whole lot more things. We just had it on for two weeks in a former miners' community centre in North Manchester. Uh, Ex-miners have got involved and other people. Unison is organising for it to be displayed in the Central Library in Manchester from June the 23rd for, for, for a month. And there's, there's several other th things in the pipeline. Just one thing that we've done with displaying these paintings that's important to do. We've also done a display on who the five are, including that they were in Angola. You, you get, so the people, the point about Mandela is, is worth thinking about. As Kenya said at the commission, it's a long walk to freedom. Think about what inspired us to join the fight with Mandela. It was that he wasn't broken and he stuck to his principles, he kept fighting. We were attracted to the fight on Mandela because of what he did. And I think that as people learn who the five are and what they've done, um, including being in Angola, they'll be attracted to this fight. So I, I think there are tremendous opportunities for us in this campaign. I think the paintings by Antonio Guerrero are a very powerful vehicle for the local CSCs to use, unions to use, uh, and other bodies. I think you can get all kinds of people that you never imagined I I involved in this. So I'd encourage you all to, to do that. This motion that you have, I would read it out, addresses uh, CSC's campaigning work uh, for the year ahead in relation to Cuba's updating of its economic policy. And it relates to paragraphs 3 and 12 and 15. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. I think it is. It could probably be turned up. Yeah, that's a lot. Is that better? Yeah. That is a lot better. Okay. Um, I won't try and sum up what you've missed. Uh, now, this strategic transformation. Of Cuba's political economy, which has now been going on for some years, as I think most of you know, has formalized after a colossal and uh, exemplary public debate and participation in the uh, Lina Nientos document, the Guidelines on Economic and Social Policy of the Revolution, which were adopted at the Party Congress in 2011 and then endorsed by the National Assembly, uh, and which are being systematically translated into policy and law and taking effect. And they include very important changes in the workforce with a third of workers expected to be uh, in the non-state sector by the end of 2016. And they include a new labor code, which was adopted in principle last December and will come into effect uh, by the end of this month, uh, adapting to these wider changes and embedding the employment rights of uh, self-employed workers and workers in the private sector. A new foreign investment law uh, adopted in March is intended to engage foreign capital far more centrally in Cuba's economic, economic development and to employ more uh, Cubans. 
changes in the management of state enterprises are going to make those enterprises more autonomous, they're going to make them more viable uh, and more vulnerable to uh, closure if they fail, they'll have a greater variety of payment system and of course as the motion highlights uh, the ending of the dual monetary system is expected. There will be a day zero. Uh, now we'll be, have the opportunity to discuss the content of those this afternoon and I'm not going to go into any further detail. Not surprisingly political enemies of Cuba, not least in the international media, mainly on the right but also sometimes on the left have characterised such changes as flexibilisation, as privatisation, marketisation, surrender to globalisation, and signalling for the Arctic time uh, the revolution's exhaustion and Cuba's transition to capitalism. And I could give you a lot of details of that kind of coverage, but let me just give you one. This is a piece of uh, so-called independent Cuban journalism that appeared on the US-based uh, website Havana Times. Uh, it says, it's discussing the draft labour bill and workers' rights. In the second paragraph it says, uh, people didn't know, for example, that the old labour code envisages the right to employment, the right to work. A right that was eliminated from the new bill without much subsidy. Eliminated. The right to work. Now this is what we're up against. Because, fair enough, these independent journalists are not very professional. The, uh, the draft bill that she was referring to uh, has 172 articles in it, which is quite a lot to read if you're not really very serious about what's going on. But here is the first article. And here are the first four words of the first article. The right to work. The right to work is founded in the relations of production of a state of workers and farmers and other manual and intellectual workers in the phase of construction of socialism and applies in Cuba in conformity with the political, social and economic fundamentals regulated by the Constitution of the Republic. Now how much clearer could that possibly be? Article 1 of the document she claims to be analysing. Now that's the kind, that's an ex exaggerated form of the kind of uh, coverage that Cuba's changes are getting. And, those, and that coverage is sometimes um, uh, inspired, let's say, by the, uh, the change of tone in the US, because it sounds as if the US Chamber of Commerce is saying, we like the changes in your system, we're going to come and help your private sector. And these are interpreted as further signals that Cuba's abandoning uh, its socialism. Now, one response we can adopt to this, and at one level we do, or should do, is that as a solidarity campaign, we stand for the end of the crippling embargo uh, on the Cuban people and for their self-determination. And self-determination is not just an anti-imperialist demand aimed at Cuba's enemies, it's a demand that we expect liberals and even some conservatives to respect, and it's also a commitment that we have to make ourselves. The Cubans insist that they are building a sustainable and prosperous socialism and will never surrender the achievements of their revolution. But if the Cubans in their self-determination are mad enough to want capitalism, that is actually their right, and they'd soon get a very different solidarity movement than they if they did. On the other hand, most of the people who join and support CSC are socialists and labour movement and other political and social activists who admire not just the anti-imperialist resistance and internationalism of the Cuban people that have already been referred to in some detail today, but also the, the, the revolution's extraordinary achievements in the fields of economic and social human rights and its constitutional commitment to constructing a socialist society based on common ownership and free of gross injustice and social violence that we enjoy in the capitalist world. So we have a particular responsibility, and that's what this motion is providing for, to provide activists and our supporters with accurate information and arguments about these changes and to put them in the context of not only of the historic gains of the revolution, but also of the validity of the Cubans' current uh, 
strategy to construct a new political economy, guarantee the achievements of the revolution, raise living standards across the broad, protect workers' employment and union representation rights. And that's the task that the historic generation, as they're known in Cuba of Fidel and Raul and the others who fought the dictatorship personally, have set themselves in the final years of their holding of office. And our task in solidarity is to clarify these processes for our supporters and other activists, identify the fundamentally socialist purpose of these changes, keep pointing out the uniqueness of the participatory processes that they've emerged from in Cuban society, and of course, to relentlessly point out how much easier it would be for the Cuban strategy to succeed if they were liberated from the multiple constraints of the US embargo and its junior partner, the European Union uh, common position. So the executive is recommending uh, to this AGM in this motion that we make this task of political solidarity a key commitment in the year ahead, that we undertake a series of actions with this in mind in terms of publicity, in terms of public, uh, publications, in terms of briefing materials for key support groups, and by organising a speaking tour with a, a Cuban economist to take place during this year. I know. Yeah. For this uh, motion, I think it's very important that we do um, make people aware and counter some of the lies and distortions that are being propagated by the right wing uh, about what is actually happening in Cuba, because it's incredibly important, I think, the economic um, changes that are taking place um, and there's been an absolutely unprecedented level of discussion um, within Cuba itself um, involving the population, you know, at all levels in, in sort of many, many, many discussions that are both informed and formed what's, you know, amendments have taken place to what's been proposed. So it's not something in the slightest that is just kind of being imposed from somewhere. It really is part and parcel of the, 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 the discussions across the population. And like Steve, I'm not going to go into the detail, and I think Steve has sort of summed it up as well in, in, in his motivation, and there's going to be the discussion this afternoon. But I think clearly, as has always been the, the goal of, the, of the, the Cuban revolution and the Cuban government, has been to raise the living, the living standards of the population continuously and to, to maintain that. And they've done that through some incredibly difficult periods um, since the revolution. You know, through the collapse of the Soviet Union, being hit by the wider, uh, more recently, the wider global economic crisis. They've had a series of um, environmental events, hurricanes, which have, which have hit them. And underpinning all of that, as Steve said, has been this vicious blockade um, by the United States. And yet they've still managed to have the flexibility and adaptions to maintain all the core uh, foundations of, of, of the country through the healthcare and education and the international solidarity um, that's taken place. And I think um, the actual survival of, of Cuba and the Cuban revolution during these difficult times is just such an incredible thing. And now, um, so on the positive side, there's actually a new global situation, which means that Cuba is taking forward these changes from a position of strength, actually, both in the progressive advances in Latin America, which has seen the connections um, and the, um, the partnerships with Venezuela and other Latin American countries in terms of investment and joint work together, uh, but also with the sort of global rise of China, which has been uh, uh, has had this massive investment and impact within Cuba as well, which has completely broken Cuba's isolation um, in, in, in an absolutely massive way. So. I mean, I think our starting point is always that it's for the Cuban people um, to decide their own future. Um, you know, I think they're clearly grasping, in my view, the sort of right steps and opportunities. Um, and, um, and obviously, the right-wing establishment internationally in the United States, it's not what they want to see. Um, they'd lo love to impose a sort of the neoliberal austerity type mo model, their solution to the economic crisis that's taken place. We're experiencing it here and across Europe. Um, and so I think we really do want to challenge the sort of lies and misinformation. I mean, Steve referred to some, that even in the New Statesman articles like his comrade Castro really giving up on the Cuban model and things like this. So we need to get in from letters to, you know, all sorts of things to sort of point out what's really happening. Um, and, um, 
this goes hand in hand with our sort of call work against the blockade. So, you know, second in the motion. Presenting Oxford Cuba Solidarity Campaign. Um, very briefly, I support everything that's been said by Steve and Jane. One aspect of this um, feature of the developments in Cuba is that it's a bit of an opposite to what we normally need to do in solidarity with Cuba. Usually we find ourselves arguing with support uh, with critics from the right and saying the reason Cuba does this is because so and so and usually we find that most people on the left understand what Cuba is doing. There are some um, aspects of this development which reverses that because there are some on the right who say yes of course we always knew Cuba would have to abandon socialism and embrace capitalism which is wrong and there are some on the left who, partly through an incomplete understanding of what Cuba is doing, and also partly because of their particular one-sided approach to the economics of socialism, are dismayed because they say, oh, it's terrible, Cuba is abandoning socialism, moving towards you know, a free trade type society. Now, both of these views are incorrect, not only politically, but in fact. And I think we need to refine our way of explaining these changes. I was um, with uh, about 20 others on a tour last year, what the one called um, In Footsteps of Fidel, and it was in the last few days of that tour that the news became common knowledge that the ending of the dual currency rather than just being a long-term goal, was now actually a, a, a fixed plan, and they announced the time scale. And we were quite surprised, and we were saying, well, how can this happen? You know, because you've still got all the tourism problems with the dual currency. But the, our guide and the other Cubans we spoke to were very firm in their confidence. It has been decided, it will happen. And the banks have been told to work out ways of making it. And I think that confidence from the Cuban people is what we need to inspire us. It has been decided that your currency will be ended, and that's part of these economic reforms. And I think they have the same attitude towards the other things. And finally, I'd just say that if we do understand, if we study and understand the changes to the Cuban um, economic system, we'll actually learn something which will be helpful to us in our arguments for moving towards socialism uh, and our arguments against capital in this country because there have been a lot of misconceptions in the past, understandably, on the left, of an egalitarian um, bent, if you like, their, their attitude to what socialism will be in the future, that everybody will be equal and everybody will have the same and all the rest of it. And that is not based in reality. If we understand the reasons why Cuba is moving towards these, these changes, we'll be better informed and we'll be better able to support Cuba. I'll do something slightly unconventional. Can you hear me? No singing. <laughs> from the website and from the BBC, but we do have a lot of eager bidders in Birmingham and in the West Midlands who produce loads of information as well for whatever reason we're organising. And it would be wonderful if somehow there could be a formal link between uh, national and local 
in that is we send them information or we send them a reason that we can make, we could know who to send it to. And in support of this motion, if we could be in touch with uh, national, national supporters who live locally, because we don't actually have a membership for our support group. People are obviously invited or you've got a large mailing list. And of course, every time we have a meeting or we see any of them, we do find the courage not to come along. And we are thinking, we used to have a membership fee, but that became very difficult to administer. Um, so if we could somehow have a close relationship with the people who are national members in our vicinity, who perhaps don't know that we're around when they think that we're only going to look at people going on from national, it would be much better. So I'm fully in support of this motion. It will make a more coherent body, and I think people will feel more supportive in general and more attention with national. I'm Wendy Hurst, um, I'm here representing ASF District Number 5. Um, obviously, nationally, ASF have always supported the CFC. Um, the motion put forward to you, I'm proud to second, because if we look at any other lobbying party, most of them have a way of getting in touch with each other locally. When we get in touch with each other locally, we're starting to make a grassroots movement rather than a national or international movement. To move our cause <laughs> forward, whether it be for the Miami Five, whether it be for the Cuban way of life, we need to focus now on ground groups. We need to make sure that we can all get together, raise what money we can, and put our cause forward. This starts at the bottom, the same as all good unions are run from the bottom up. Please support. <laughs> Business International Committee, and it just cannot let the day go by without um, a, a, a word to CSC um, about the International Commission. It was absolutely a fantastic affair. It was organised uh, perfectly. I could not, I could not criticise it in any way. Uh, I'd like to thank Rob and his team. It was uh, amazing to be a part of it. Uh, thought-provoking, exciting, emotional, it was a roller coaster. The whole three events fitted in and slotted in nicely. I certainly reported back to my <laughs> 1.3 million members through the executive committee that it was the sense of injustice, the sense of outrage, that, which, which was uh, thought-provoking and uh, to certainly myself and the chair of the international committee was there. Um, again, I'd like to, I cannot go uh, let this day go by without uh, saying a big thank you to CSA, CSA and the members. Thank you. For a large number of years uh, in propagandising, as I suppose you could call it, Tony. Yeah. From a London taxi, <coughs> which uh, I know you read about it in QVC before, but while we've got a, a moment, I just wanted Tony to come up here and say a few words because what he's been doing over the last 12, 15 years has been absolutely amazing. It's not only has he been work in the streets of London uh, and telling absolutely everybody he can get in the cab about Cuba, but he is absolutely always on London radio, uh, which is something I think we could all take a, a lesson from, because Tony is on, on the radio so much that he's got uh, the acronym Cuba uh, Cuba Tony, I think they call you, don't they, on the, despite your numerous names that you use to get on the radio, <laughs> they, they recognise you each time. But his latest endeavour, I mean, many of you would have seen the, the taxi and the, the vigils and the events, he's, he's actually really helpful for us in the office uh, in, in terms of the work we do for lots of reasons. But I think his latest endeavour has been something quite remarkable, and I know many of you here contributed, but um, we're very proud to have supported uh, Tony in the endeavour to send the taxi to Havana. And um, have you got the photos? Yeah. Can you put them on? Uh, <coughs> he's raised. Well, not all the money, and we're still appealing for funds to help pay for this. But London taxis, as you know, after a while, they um, reach their sell by date. Is that the way of putting it? Yes. And this taxi has gone all the way to Havana, and we were in commitment shipping it to the Motor Museum in Havana, and it landed in the Motor Museum in May, and a delegation from the May Day Study Tour uh, <laughs> saw. Uh, the, the, the cabin. It's now in the Merck Museum in Havana, and whenever you go there, you can see that London taxi in Havana. So, Tony, do you want to come up and say a few words? Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you.
really know me name, so I don't have to introduce myself. But what I can say over 16 years of running around London is, is a wealth of information. The cab with politicians getting in and lawyers and, and, and all the rest of it. But the message that the Cuban Solidarity Campaign has got out over the last decade or so, it's reflected back in the cab because I get people in the cab now, as soon as I mention Cuba, do you know they've got one of the best health systems? Do you know their education system beats ours? So the message that we've been doing over the years as a campaign, a trade union movement, uh, has really got out. And um, but what I do love, uh, passengers in the cab, of course, is politicians, because they get out the steam coming out of their ears. I love it. It really is an audience of two or three of them in the cab. And when I know they're politicians, I sort of... Uh, Anna Salbury was the last one that got in the cab, and I, I knew she was a politician. I couldn't remember what party she was from. She got in with her daughter, and I said, you're a politician? She says, yes, I am. I said to her, you know what, none of you have got the, the backbone or the spunk to stand up to the American foreign policy. I says, we are where we are because of American foreign policy. Didn't say a word, but she still tipped me at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I just can't help myself when people get in the cab. You know, I'm talking to the whole world, to a wealth of information. I've had lots of celebrities in the cab, of course. I've had David Bailey many years ago, and I went on about Cuba, and within a few years, you know, there's a documentary, he did some film work out there. Trevor MacDonald, I gave him some information on the meningitis vaccine, and within about a year, Trevor MacDonald went to Cuba on this uh, medical system and, and the vaccines that were produced in Cuba for the, um, uh, yeah, for children and all the rest of it. So, yeah, and the, and the cab's done a lot, because to drive into a railway station and there's no cabs there, and the train's just coming, and the cab used to do a U-turn at King's Cross. I used to feel really great. <laughs> <laughs> viva the revolution and viva Fidel and viva Cuba. <laughs> One last thing, I did make a, um, a few words to the audience there at, at the museum. I said the cab had original gearbox and engine with nearly 400,000 miles on the meter. I said it reflects the fortitude and the resilience of the Cuban <laughs> so people. The uh, discussion. One of the things that struck me very strongly about the film that we saw was the comment from Ricardo Alacon, which I thought was a bit sobering, and that was that whilst we certainly celebrate the release of Rene and Fernando, uh, nevertheless it was a defeat because they served their full sentence. I think that just should underscore to us the importance and the urgency of building the campaign of the five uh, to ensure that Ramon and Antonio and Ferrado are immediately and unconditionally released. And that means it's important that we, as the resolution said and as the speakers in the course of the debate underlined that we build this as a major campaign and that we say in building that campaign there are no preconditions in terms of people supporting it that we can reach out on a broad basis taking all the kind of imaginative initiatives which Doli and other people in the course of the discussion expressed about cultural events about going to youth about finding new ways and innovative ways of approaching people in order that we can spread that message out because it really is a matter of urgency that we build that campaign and extend it in whatever ways we can. Looking, it seems to me, uh, to deepen it within the trade union movement as well. Looking perhaps towards those affiliated unions uh, who are affiliated to CSC, perhaps using their affiliation to actually bring some pressure to bear on the Labour Party uh, in terms of their positions as a public political party, so that if they are returned to government, we are in a more favourable condition in relation to the release of the five and in relation to relationships with Cuba so that we don't see a future British government at Baru, Rene or Fernando or any one of the five from coming here to address us here in Britain. So just to underline the way in which people have expressed their views on that. On the question of the economic changes which uh, Steve and Jane and David I think spoke about in respect of that. I think that is extremely important because I think we said this last year, but I think it is true, that we may well see a, an offensive from people against Cuba heightened in some respect, because whilst they will say, oh, these are changes which suggest some kind of liberalization, they will try to make a political offensive against Cuba in terms of drawing out all of the old chestnuts 
about human rights and things like that. And I think we have to be vigilant in terms of responding to that, taking initiatives individually to write to newspapers, to respond to the way in which Tony does, of challenging people who've got those kind of points of view across. So I hope people will do that. And just to briefly underscore points that are in that resolution about what we intend to do. We intend to produce briefing material so that people can be familiar with this, so that local groups can plan and organize meetings, and hopefully, if we are able to bring a Cuban economist over, of making a major initiative in terms of that. I think that would be very, very important and very critical. I think looking to producing specifically briefing material for the trade units on these developments, and perhaps calling uh, national and regional briefing meetings where that's possible and where that's appropriate. So I think there's a lot to engage with in terms of that issue. And just to say, in response to the, the debate on the local groups issue, we have three, uh, and obviously we're about to elect the executive committee, so we will see that confirmed. We have three members of the executive committee who have a specific responsibility for local group work. Uh, those members on the committee have reported in each executive meeting about developments that are taking place in the local groups. And those of you from local groups, please see those three representatives on the committee as your avenue to channel information, views, requests, and so on through to the executive. But I know in addition to that, that the national office is very responsive to requests from local groups with helps about speakers, speakers' tours, suggestions about films and material that could be used in publications and publicity uh, and in organizing meetings. So feel free, and I'm sure this will be responded to absolutely positively, as it always has been. Please contact the National Office if you want assistance in those kind of initiatives. Comrades, I think the plan and the contributions that people have made have all underlined the importance of the work that we undertake. I just want briefly to add my thanks to all of those that have been expressed already, uh, to the staff, to the volunteers, to the local groups, to the individual members, to the affiliates of the campaign for the work that you have done, and just say, please ensure that the plan that we agree is not just a resolution that we pass on paper, but it's something that we're actively looking to implement in the year ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I feel more comfortable talking from here. No? I don't know if it's my size or what. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it is a big honor to be here with you today in this AEM. I must tell you that I am reaching my fourth year here in the UK, and this is the first time, even though I attend a lot of activities of the Solidarity Movement, this is the first time I am present in an AGM meeting. And the reason is because you always have this meeting around June, mid-June, which used to be the time when I was going home for holiday. So most of the years I've been in the UK, at this point in time, I was enjoying sunny Havana. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you but, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so um, our dear Colonel Rob Miller felt that even though I told him today, this morning, I was on an official uh, duties, that I should come even for a brief time because uh, he said this might be my last ADA, oh. my last chance to, to talk to you. And I say yes, definitely, I must say, June next year, I will not be, I guess, I will not be around next year, but there is an advantage there. I sure will be, I uh, expect to be in Havana, so when all of you come there, you can find a friend, a house, and a lot of love for all of you. but I am going to say something different. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say uh, here that I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, all of you, for the work you do on behalf of Cuba. And I can tell you my work here as an ambassador would not have been so pleasant and fulfilling if it had not been for all of you. And the support you have given me, not only here in London, but anywhere I've been in the UK, everywhere I go, I have felt the friends there that were waiting for me, 
I think was so emotional to get to places where I expected maybe uh, to meet with 20, 30 people and then I will feel uh, find a full room of uh, a lot of contacts and friends that came to, to listen to me. Uh, what you do here, uh, I cannot put it in words, it's so important, but you have made, I can assure you, a lot of difference for us and the work we do here in the in UK. Actually, every time I talk to my colleagues, my uh, colleagues ambassador, before coming here, I was talking just to a uh, Latin American ambassador, uh, and I was explaining to you, to him, what the Cuban solidarity campaign was, and the work you have been doing for years in support of Cuba. And you know, you have never tired, you have never um, ceased to commit yourself to this cause, and we have always been able to count on you for anything, any kind of help, support we needed in very important causes. You know very well what you have been supporting us with. Uh, you have been uh, just uh, condemning the blockade. You know the blockade is still alive and well. You know some people think that uh, or pretend to say that the blockade is no longer there. Maybe uh, the press or other people who do not want us to know about that or people to know about that pretend that the blockade is no longer there. But I will say it's alive and well. And if you see recently, they are trying to to find a Paris bank or French bank, an incredible sum of ten billion dollars because they have uh, supposedly. Uh, broke the sanction or just uh, overcome the sanction uh, among, uh, for some country, but among them of Cuba. And you can see in every, in our daily life, even here for us as an embassy, we can feel that blockade working every day of our life, uh, um, like uh, banks closing our accounts and making the, our life financially very difficult, giving the to the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, even to buy some books uh, in the U.S. or to the U.S. Uh, and these are not things that appear in the press. This is not, you cannot read about this, but it is part of our everyday life that they are still trying to make our life difficult in many senses. Uh, these days, people tell me, because they hear here and there that there are people, voices in the U.S., asking for uh, the lifting of the embargo, for the lifting of the blockade, for improving the relations with Cuba. That is true, there are voices in the U.S. these days who are calling for that. But I would say that will come from people who have a more um, intelligent view of how the relations should be with Cuba. And these are people who along this year have been convinced that the policy they have been carried out up to now hasn't worked. So I will say it's only logical. Mm. It doesn't take to be too bright to understand <laughs> that they have been wasting their time. You know, the other day I saw 22 years have passed in the demise of the Soviet Union, and everybody thought that Cuba will be next. You know, uh, at that time we were called puppets, uh, stupid, and all that kind of work. And then they said we didn't have 24 hours to live after that. And 22 years has passed. <laughs> 22 years, that's a long time. And Cuba is still uh, uh, strong, is still surviving, is still trying to live in a sea of capitalism, which is what we have around us, and we still be able to build a society, a socialist society that is sustainable, and that is uh, prosperous, which will be uh, our aim. Uh, there is a lot of talk, you will have later on uh, a conference or a pro um, uh, about the changes, economic changes that are taking care of in Cuba, that are uh, going on in Cuba, that have to do with the way we will manage the economy. But it, the principles of a, a socialist society have not changed. The, uh, the means, is, uh, the riches of the country will remain in the hands of the people 
represented by the state, of course, but we are not in any way selling the country to foreign investment. We are not pretending that uh, we are not just um, bringing in gambling, things like that, that we have gave up a long time ago. But of course, we will have to try to be more efficient to have an economy that serves the needs of everybody. Actually, that's what socialism is all about. And that was the aim, to be able to give everybody what everybody needs according to their contribution to the society. And still, you know, those of you, most of you have been to Cuba many times, and you see that still we have difficulties, we have problems, and that we haven't reached that level of prosperity that will allow Cuba to solve the, I would say, the basic problems of the whole society. We have problems with transport, housing is a big problem, it's still uh, the salaries uh, uh, of the, uh, some categories of workers, even though some raises have been done to certain categories of visitors, uh, still the salaries are not enough to, to cover all the, the needs. But one thing it's important to say is that the basic of that society, the basic that brought me to the court of St. James, that's what they call it, uh, it's still there, free education, free health services, security. The, about two weeks ago, a group of uh, students went to Cuba from a local university, and when they came back, they were in their 20s. Uh, I was very impressed by what they told me. They went to Cuba, and they, they are between 20, 25 years old doing a, a course in one of the a local universities here, and they are from different nationalities. They are UK, Europeans, Americans. And when they came back, I said, what impressed you more about Cuba? And what the first thing they told me was security. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the, we are talking about 20s, people in their 20s. They say security. When somebody in the street approached us, we didn't feel threatened. Mm -hmm. We knew they would do it for, for a good reason. That was good. It was good to get away from our cell phones for, for a while. <laughs> it was good not to be pressed all the time by a cell phone. It was very good to, we didn't see advertisement along the street that was something different. And then they say, uh, we visit universities and we were impressed by the level of expertise of these students, despite the fact that they don't have the materials, possibilities that we have. They have advanced a lot in, in sciences and things, even though they don't have the kind of laboratories and things we have. And then, but the last thing they told me, and that is what I wanted to stress here, everybody looks so happy. And I, I'm telling you, this is the, the impression of uh, these students. They are not uh, Marxist trained. They come from different countries. Even they come from former uh, countries in the Eastern, in the Eastern Bloc. But they, that's how they saw Cuba uh, when they went there. And I say that despite all the difficulties, despite all the hardships we still might come, we are a happy people. We have a government who has our interest, uh, is their best interest as well. We have uh, liberty, we have sovereignty, we have pride in ourselves. Uh, we have, even talking as a woman, we have made big advances in gender equality. Uh, next week, I'm going to receive here, sometime even we are doing too good, which uh, <laughs> might be a problem. Uh, next week, I'm receiving here a delegation. Uh, 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 it's a trade delegation by the Ministry of Trade in Cuba, and the lady, is, there is a lady presiding the delegation, and she's coming with a delegation of seven members, six women, one man. <laughs> <laughs> she gets here, this delegation of six women, one man, will be joined by me and my Council for Economic Affairs, two other women, so it will be 
<laughs> hey, we bring one more. <laughs> so I guess when we go to this seminar in London and when we go to Glasgow, which is the other city we are going to visit, it will make a, a strong impression to see a bunch, you know, such a strong delegation of women. Um, if you go a few years back at the beginning of the Cuban Revolution, you know that was not the case. Now we have managed to have almost 50% of our MPs are women, not even Westminster can uh, say that. Uh, half of our MPs are women and uh, our children are healthy. Uh, we have uh, made big advances in biotechnology. And the most important thing of all is that Cuba has had a policy of sharing the litter it has. We are not the kind of country who give what it has in excess. We have always, even during the toughest time, we have shared whatever little we have. And there is a proof of that all over the world when you go to Africa and you see somebody speaking Spanish in any African country. I can, I can bet you that if you ask them, most probably they study in Cuba. When you go to Latin America and you see so many people that have been operated and recover their eyesight, all the doctors we have in Latin America working uh, in places where they have never been a doctor before, uh, this uh, makes us proud. Actually, we don't believe that we have a perfect society, we have to continue to work with it, nothing is perfect, but we have a degree of, uh, uh, we feel proud of what we have achieved, and we feel committed to with, with those things we haven't achieved. Yet. And we are only would like to say to this, and in this struggle, and still we believe that a better world is possible. And in this struggle, you have always uh, accompanied us, and we hope, I hope, that you will keep accompanying us in this struggle to make a better society for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chester. That was a wonderful speech. And call on Jane on behalf of the CSC executive to vote the vote. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yes, um, as, as Esther said earlier, she's going to be leaving us um, later on this year. Um, and this is indeed her last day GM here. So I was very pleased to, to say on behalf of, of the executive, but the campaign and indeed all of our activists, all of our members and supporters, everywhere to extend a really big thank you to Esther. Um, you know, it's, you spoke about thanks for us earlier, but I have to say, it's just been, it's such a privilege to work in support of Cuba, and it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to work with you. You've been an absolutely excellent ambassador, um, putting such a lot of work over the past few years, um, travelling up and down the country, I mean, tirelessly, um, in meetings everywhere, trade union conferences. I mean, you must be very familiar trade union conferences by now um, and the ins and outs of the British trade union movement have been spoken at so many different meetings so um, you know and, it's, and, and like I say it's been a real privilege to, to support Cuba in all of that time and you've also become a very good friend to, to many of us as well um, during that time as well along with the, the great team that you have at the embassy um, it's been a really really strong support for the work of the campaign in that time and obviously there's been a lot of developments a lot of campaigning work that we've, we've, we've worked together on i mean i think that we had the the cuba 50 campaign five years ago to celebrate all the positive achievements that that, that, that you've just spoken about um and in the in, in the face of the blockade and the big event that was at the barbican that year bringing it right up to this year when we had the, the campaign um, for the five um there which was an equally you know huge that we heard about earlier, and, um, and Esther's just been there supporting um, all, all the way through that. So we'll be sort of saying, that, saying a goodbye, but later this year, as we were saying earlier, um, and also to es Esther's husband, Angel, who people will also have got to, got to know, um, who's an incredible um, cocktail maker, along with other things, so we've all experienced. Um, and you'll be going back to with our, our, the sort of Cuban style weather that we've had for the last few days up today but you'll be going back to the real thing um, so a really warm thank you um, on behalf of all of us and best wishes and, and we definitely take note of your invitation to come and visit so uh, we will all be able to see you <laughs> <laughs>